Hello and welcome to your go-to Detroit Pistons podcast, The Pistons Pulse, co-hosted by me, Bryce Simon of Motor City Hoops, a former D1 hooper and current teacher, husband, and father of three amazing kids. And I'm Omari Sanko for the second Pistons beat writer for the Detroit Free Press. And of course, we're always blessed to be joined by our producer, Wes Davenport. And I want to spend a second to send a special shout out to my editor over at Detroit Bad Boy, someone who's been a lot to my career and what I've done. And that's Sean Corp. He lost someone very close to him over the last couple of weeks. I don't mean to start out the podcast on a somber mood, but just wanted to send a shout out to Sean and everything he's going through right now. Amari. This is your last episode before, are we going to get off season O coming soon on X or Twitter? Or can, can we just agree to call it Twitter? I don't want to call it it's X. It's Twitter. It's Twitter. Okay. The, the website is still called Twitter when you type it in. If you just go on X.com, I don't think it'll bring you Twitter. So as far as I'm concerned, it's Twitter. All right. So is off season O coming around soon? Off season O is coming around soon. Yeah, I'm going to be off for three weeks starting on Sunday. And it, we, the pop will still go. I know Bryce and Wes are going to hold down to Fort. While I'm away, I think I'll only be gone two episodes since we're recording this one now. I guess we record early to get around me being off next week. But yeah, it'll be it'll be good. I haven't taken any real time off since like this time last year. So I'm definitely crawling to the finish line a little bit here. But not for the pot, though. I'm fully energetic for this one. Before we get going, can I ask about the Rico Hines runs and all these offseason workouts? Am I just being an old man right now, Omari, by not getting excited? Like I can't even bring myself to watch the Rico Hine full video. And I, it makes me feel like a bad Pistons content creator that I don't care to watch it. But I just, I, I just don't. I, I don't know what's wrong with, what's wrong with me, Omari? You know, like I watched it more so out of just doing my job than like maybe excitement for the actual runs. You just kind of expect NBA players to look good in those runs. Like, I don't necessarily take a lot from guys who probably should be playing well in those things, playing pretty well, because it's not, you know, it's not NBA basketball. Uh, you know, obviously, I mean, there are some cool stuff, like K getting to a step back mid-range, uh, Asar doing the same stuff on defense he did uh, in Las Vegas, and of course at OTE. So some stuff stands out, but as a whole, I probably am closer to you than maybe the average Pistons Twitter person who's like super hyped over it. For me, it's just, if it's not real basketball, I don't put as much stock into it. And I want to make it very clear. I understand why fans go crazy about it. I get it. Like, I understand that we haven't had any legitimate basketball, Pistons basketball anyway, since Summer League. You know, all we're getting basketball in general. I mean, WNBA, obviously, but we have the USA team playing, but we don't have any Pistons on that. So I just... I don't get overly excited, but I do admit, I understand why Pistons fans get excited. It just, to me, even that is different than like the K Team USA Select stuff, right? Like that, I don't even know how much we should buy into that because I heard they ask him to play the Luka role and they beat the regular team, which I think happens every year, but it's even less than that. So I, I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer. I just I just needed you to talk me off like, hey man, like get your stuff together. Um, I thought maybe just because school just started, Amari, and I'm a little run down from the start of the school year, but um, that makes me feel a little bit better that you aren't like just over the top about it. For me, it's just off-season basketball stuff in general. Like we always say, summer league, you can't put too much stock into it. Like Rico Hines, is, you know, it's like in the same category, which, like, I don't want to put the league down or anything. I'm not trying to do that. It's just, I don't think you can extrapolate what you see in Rico Hines and apply it 1-1 to, like, what's going to happen during the season, right? Like, I think you expect them to play better because they're not necessarily d up and doing the, the same thing. So it's, like, it's exciting to see the players, right? If you're a fan, it's cool to, you know, see them in action. For Cade especially, you know, obviously he didn't play most of last season. So to see him uh, get a full run in, and play well is is great, but I think I'm in the same boat as you. I'm not I'm not the type who's going to like retweet the videos and be like, this is exactly what's going to happen next season. It's just you, they should be doing that, right? <laughs> and we're going to talk about next season in just a second. We do have some ratings and reviews we got to get to Amari because we've had guests on. So this is from the DBB comments. Um, it's from a thread over there, and it's Benson Nine. Just wanted to give them a shout out. He said, "I love your podcast. It's one of the best. Blessing to you and your family from Japan." So always enjoy shouting out people who are listening from other countries as well as the United States. Jerry Khalil, I wanted to give him a shout out. Him and I email back and forth, and Amari, our food stuff is traveling because he sent me an email just to say he had cooked for a neighborhood block party and smoked a brisket for the first time and it came out stellar. So have nice. you ever done a brisket? Is that is that up your alley there or no? 
I've never smoked anything. My apartment complex does not allow grills or smokers of any sort. You know, maybe if one day I buy a house, I'll be able to. I do. I do want to smoke meat. Like that's something that's like one of my. I don't want to say like a life go. I mean, okay, it's like a life go. I'm going to be like the guy with the smoker in the backyard who could just smoke anything and it's like delicious. So I can't do it right now. I don't have the I don't have the resources, but that does sound amazing. That guy is very popular on every block in America. I will say that person on our block is actually my wife. She does all the grilling. I bought her a really nice grill. She tricked me into it, um, but she puts it to good use, which I appreciate. Also, we got a new Apple review. It's actually from my high school math teacher and my high school <laughs> nice. friend father. I appreciate him supporting because he's not a Pistons fan. He only listens to this because uh, we used to coach together and and, and he likes to listen to us talk hoop. So Kent67878 says, great show and he loved the porcupine meatball story. Obviously, he knows my parents and all that as well. So shout out Mr. Brown, the best math teacher in the country. And then Omari, we finally hit 200 reviews on Apple. We're at 259 on Spotify. Just want to thank everybody that listens to us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you find us, ratings, reviews, likes, subscribes, whatever you're doing. Uh, I, this thing has gone so much further than we ever could have imagined. We appreciate you guys so much. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a, amazing. Like just seeing the numbers grow. I know we can't give the actual numbers, but you know, the past has done fantastic. And I feel like this has been our best year, you know, so far. So it means a lot to hit 200 reviews. Of course, keep them coming and we'll shout you out. And it just, it, it means a lot. It really does. You know, this is my, I don't, I didn't come with the podcasting background that Bryce had. This was like my first one. So just to see it take off the way it has, has been really gratifying. Yeah, it's awesome. And guys, we're going to have Keith Smith on next week. And then the week after that, Wes is going to join the show with Jack Kelly, the DBB live crew. You should be tuning into them every, I think it's a lot of times on Fridays now, but that's going to be awesome. We're going to hold down the fort while Amari gets a much deserved and earned couple week vacation before we get back into things. But Wes texted us the other day for the outline said it's been almost exactly one year since we did the season expectation episode last year. So we're going to revive that. We're going to start with the 2020 draft class, Omari. We had somebody say less Killian Hayes talk, but we're starting with Killian Hayes, who did average over 10 points a game last year, Omari, right around three rebounds over six assists, 38% from the field, 28% from three, 82% from the free throw line. What are our projected stats for Killian Hayes this year with the Detroit Pistons? Probably going down a little bit, right? Just looking at the backcourt rotation. Um, I mean, unless he has like a killer camp, which he could, but it's just so much competition in that backcourt that you just wonder minutes-wise and row-wise what would be there for him, which makes the projection tough, right? So, you know, 10 points, six assists probably goes down a little bit. You know, I'd be curious to see if the efficiency could tick up. So my prediction for Killian, and I'm going to try not to deal with like decimal points and all that. I'm just, you know, whole numbers, <laughs> easy math. I'm, I'm going to go six points, uh, three assists. Uh, I, I'm going to bump up the field goal percentage. I think he cracks 40%, and I'll say 30% from three. Interesting. Okay, so I went less than five points per game and less than five assists per game with the Pistons, but for the same reason you're talking. I just don't think he's going to get the minutes with Detroit. I, maybe I'm way off here, but between Cade, Ivy, Monty Morris, Alec Burks, even Marcus Sasser, I just don't know where the minutes are coming from, assuming health, right? And that's one thing. When we did these last year, one, Boyan got traded for after we did these, I believe, but then also we just never know about health. So I actually put in a little caveat here, Omari, so I'll see what you think. I said... These are going to be Killian stats with the San Antonio Spurs, who I think he ends up playing for this year. Eight points a game, three rebounds, six assists, but I think he stays under 40% from the field and unfortunately under 30% from three. Yeah, I mean, he's been, that's been his career averages up until this point. I mean, even with the hot streak last year, uh, once it kind of evened out over the course of the year, uh, I think his percentages were almost one-to-one, like his career averages, which is not what you want to see. Uh, I think just with him having to, to do less, that may just help him get better shots. So I'll put him above 40% this year. All right, let's keep it moving to James Wiseman because I do think this one will be a lot more interesting. And I think Wiseman is one of those players for Detroit this year that I think the fan base is going to be a little bit split on. And I think he's going to end up playing more than maybe what I want him to play. So it'll be interesting. So last season, just with Detroit, Omari, 12.7 points a game, eight rebounds, less than a block, 
right around 63% from the field and 17% from the three-point line. So what do you think the role is for James Wiseman? And then in turn, where does that put his stats? And we'll go ahead and average these ones. Wes, if you can help me out, maybe put it in the comments or the private chat at the end after we both give ours. I feel like it's a lot harder to project Rose this year than last year just because they have more depth and then also a lot of positional overlap that they didn't have uh, this time last year. So Wiseman, he's sort of in the same situation as Killian where, well, really a lot of ways the same situation situation as Killian where it's a contract year, you're going to be a restricted free agent uh, next summer and you need this opportunity to prove yourself, but how many minutes would be there, right? Uh, you know, Isaiah Stewart, I think we could say he's going to play a lot. Jalen Duran's going to play a lot. Then you have Bagley and Wiseman who do a lot of the same things. Uh, but along with that, you have a guy in Joe Harris who may, if he's going to be in the ro- rotation, what's going to give? Is Isaiah losing minutes? Is Asar Thompson losing minutes? Or is are we going to get 48 minutes of Duran and Stewart at center? And that allows Joe Harris to kind of fill in at the uh, three or two or wherever you want to put him. So it's tough to say exactly what James Wiseman role will be the extent that Monty Williams will want to rely on, on a two-big lineup, but that experiment will, will, will continue up under a new coaching staff. So there's a lot uh, that really makes it hard to project uh, some of these players. But I'm just going to go along the same lines as Killian, where the minutes probably aren't there because they're going to be trying to win games. Of course, after the trade that line last year, they began to wind players down, and he had an inflated role because of that. I'm going to go. I'm going to go eight points, uh, six rebounds. And 0.7 blocks, and a, and I'll give him I'll give him 64 percent field goal percentage. Awesome. Real quick on Hayes, we ended up of an average of five points, three assists, 40 percent from the field, 30 percent from three. I'm actually going a little bit the opposite, Omar, because okay. I actually I personally would probably prioritize Marvin Bagley the third. That's just kind of my vibe right now with the Wiseman versus Bagley stuff. I know that's probably the minority. I have a lot of people say, well, we know what Bagley is. Let's find out what Wiseman is. And that's completely fair. I also want to say, I don't want to see the two big lineup where those are your two bigs off the bench. I don't necessarily want to see that. But I think what the team is going to do, and this may be the smart thing, is I think they are going to prioritize Wiseman off the bench. And so I actually kept his numbers relatively the same. I have him at 13 points, eight rebounds. I gave him some love and went over one block per game. I don't know a whole lot over, but over one block per game, which wasn't the case last year, but still under 20% from three. So I, I just think that more for me is the team I feel like is going to prioritize getting him minutes at least early in the year. And so I think those numbers will be relatively the same. And I could absolutely see that as well. I mean, again, it's just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of chess. I think Monty's going to have to play to find the right balance of giving players opportunities who need them because of contract situations, uh, developing players, and then also putting them in positions to win. Uh, you know, so it's, it's possible that some guys that may not play as many minutes until later on in the season, depending on where they are in the Eastern Conference standings. But I'm going to stick with that. I think maybe a slightly uh, reduced role for Wiseman just because there was really no competition for his minutes uh, when he was traded for last year. So I think that's probably going to change going into this season. And maybe it's a thing where they prioritize those guys both getting minutes where Bagley is, you know, a few game stretch here and then Wiseman a few game stretch here. And I want to ask you this before we get to what our average there was. I actually think he ends up taking more three-point attempts than what the fan base wants to see. I think we're going to see him try to stretch the floor, take one or two threes a game. I'm not saying the Isaiah Stewart plan, but I think we're going to see more of that than what maybe the fan, like again, than what the fan base wants to see. Where are you, where are you at on that with Wiseman kind of shooting from the perimeter? I'm curious to see. I think we've seen Duran take a lot of jumpers this summer as well, uh, whether it's Summer League or just Rico Hines or wherever else. They only have one floor spacer in that front court, right? Isaiah Stewart. And ideally, you would want another guy in there so that you're not just relying on Beef Stew to provide all the spacing. I can see Wiseman taking threes here and there. I don't know if it'll become... I don't know if I'm quite there on it becoming like a regular part of his arsenal, but I could see... I can see it ticking up a little bit just spacing wise. If you're playing too big, somebody's got to space the court. So I agree. So we ended up with 10 points per game, seven rebounds per game, 0.8 blocks, 64% from the field, less than 20% from three. I like that 10 and seven. I think that's why we work together well. We have this symmetry here, Omari, is together. I think we get to the numbers that make a lot of sense. And so next, we're going to talk about a guy that you just mentioned. I think. 
the most polarizing player on the roster going into the season. I never thought I would say this about Isaiah Stewart. I always thought he'd be a fan favorite just because of his play style. But man, when he got that contract, you all of a sudden found out there were some people who really do not believe in beef stew. So last year, 11 points a game, eight rebounds, less than a block, 32.7% from three. I'm going to go ahead and jump in here, Amari. I think Stu averages 12 points, seven rebounds. The rebounds are down because I think Duran rebounds so well. Asar rebounds so well. Cade's a good rebounder, so I don't think there's going to be a ton there. And he'll be shooting. And he'll be shooting on the perimeter. I have him less than a block per game still, but the number that I think is most important for Stu and I'm going to stay believing in, I have him at 35% from the three-point line this next season. Okay, we're actually pretty similar there. Um, So this average should be pretty easy. I got him at 13 points, seven rebounds, uh, under a block, like 0.7. I think it'll still be around the same last year. And I have him at 36% for three. Uh, Just, I think, I think that's really going to be a weapon for him next season. And, I think he'll take him at volume like last season as well. So the main thing with Stewart, and I kind of alluded to it earlier rotation-wise, is does he spend time at the five or is he going to be a full-time four? And, you know, if he plays a lot of minutes at the five, then you got to add a few more blocks. Well, not a few more blocks, but he's going to block more shots, obviously, and uh, and, and rebound a little bit too. So it's tough to say exactly stat-wise where he'll be, but I think it'll be a slight uptick from last season as far as points. I'll tell you a couple... Other areas I'm really interested with Stu this season, especially if those minutes are at the four. And you've talked about it a little bit. I want to see the assist numbers. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be assists, Omari, but I want to see how well he passes. At the four, he's going to have to be able to be a ball mover, one more passes, attack a closeout, maybe throw a lob. We saw him trying to throw some lobs to Duran, and he just missed them um, in terms of just throwing how accurate they were. And then also, I want to see the weak side rim protection. I think one thing this team has missed since they traded Jeremy Grant is a weak side rim protector as the low man. Jeremy Grant was really good at that. I think that's something Stu could be good at. And so I'm really interested to see if he can provide value where the blocks or at least the rim protection goes up and then the passing. Obviously, the shot's the most important. I think we both agree with that. Yeah, the shot's the most important. You want to see him spacing the floor. I mean, we've talked about Isaiah so much. You know, he's not efficient near the rim. You want him probably spacing out a little bit more. And I think that's a misconception with Isaiah Stewart is people kind of see his build and they're like, yeah, he needs to be down down, down low banging with those guys. It's like, no, nah, you know, he's... Uh, you know, I think the path he's on is 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 fair. So I, I I would agree with that. I would agree with that. So Isaiah Stewart, our average comes to 12 and a half, seven rebounds, still less than a block, and then 35.5% from three. If those are Stu's numbers with what we think he is defensively and everything else, I think Isaiah Stewart is in really good shape. Real quick here, I know there's some weather out there in Detroit or in Michigan area. I shouldn't say Detroit, in the Michigan area. So anybody listening or if you're listening to this later on, I hope everybody is safe. Um, please, uh, you know, I, I hope everybody is is in good shape with that. Before we go to the break, we did have a couple questions. I'm going to save the Jaden IDV one for after the break when we talk about him. Who do you guys think will surprise us with a skill we were not expecting? That is really interesting because I think you can't answer Isaiah Stewart, Amari, because I, for both of us, I think that's a skill we were both expecting him to have. I'm going to say Cade comes out with something that we're not looking for right now. If I had to bet on somebody that's going to show something, especially offensively, that we're not talking about right now, I think you know the smart money would be on Cade Cunningham doing that. That's tough because all the ones I'm thinking of are like natural pro- pro- progression things. I'm trying to think of something a little bit more outside the box. Like My initial one was we see Jaden and Ivy get to the line more. Uh, you know, because guys a lot, like last season talked about trying to learn from Alec Burks, uh, you know, just all the, the tricks he has. And he probably didn't get to the line as much as you would want to see from somebody with just his burst. So that's like the boring one. But if I had to come up with a more interesting one, I would say we see K posting up smaller guards. Like he's going to, you it. know, like he's 6'6", like he did it in college. Uh, Dwayne Casey talked about him doing it last season. And obviously do coaching staff. So, you know, that may not translate over, but. You know, Kay's just got a lot of tools in his bag and I could see him posting up smaller guards. I would love it, man. That was one thing I really liked from him coming out of college, Omari. And I thought he was going to do it 
in his rookie season and we never really saw it. Mel says he was doing it at Rico Hines. So maybe I got to go turn that film on now and eat my words from the beginning of the episode. But yeah, man, that that would be awesome. And I, I got to share this from Brian Parsons. Keep up the good work from a lifelong Pistons fan in Kansas. Let's go, man. Like I figured I was alone out here in Kansas. Kansas representation. Yeah, okay, I, there I we go. It. I thought the only people in Kansas listening to the Pistons polls were my close friends and family. And sometimes they don't even listen. So, all right, we got to go to a quick break right here when we come back Omari we're going to dive into the 2022 draft class plus the aforementioned Cade Cunningham starting off with the big man Jalen Duran. All right, we're back with segment two, and we're just going to dive right into Jalen Duran here. Uh, Bryce, obviously, he was close to a double-double last season, 9.1 points, 8.9 rebounds, uh, 0.9 blocks, so basically a block per game. And his minutes were not super high. You know, he had some foul trouble, some con- conditioning stuff, so he'd average almost a double-double in uh, less than 30 minutes a game, which obviously is good. So, you know, I'm, I'm guessing there's probably going to be an uptick uh, stats wise from you I'm just curious to see to what extent I'm in the same boat we've talked about it a little bit already I think that Jalen Duran unquestionably is the big man that they are going to prioritize the most I think he is the starting center I don't think it's possibly James Wiseman I don't think it's Bagley I think it's Jalen Duran I think there's three guaranteed starters for the Pistons and it's Cade Ivy and Jalen Duran and so I think I'm with you. I think he's going to play more minutes this year. I kind of copped out a little bit here. So good luck with these averages, Wes. I just said he's going to average more than 10 points per game. He's going to average more than 10 rebounds per game. And I have him averaging more than one and a half blocks per game. Now, I'm not going to go a whole lot higher than that. I don't think he's getting enough shots to average like 15 points a game. I don't know about rebounds, man. Like it, it could be something silly with the way he offensive rebounds, and if the defensive rebounding comes around as well, it really could be something special. But I feel very confident that he's going to average a really solid double double and more than a block and a half per game. Yeah, I've got him at twelve points, twelve rebounds, and a block and a half. I said I was, I was, was going to do whole numbers, but it's hard to do that for blocks. So a block and a half. I mean, again, like he's already a monstrous rebounder, so. I'll be surprised if he's getting, you know, the minutes we think he'll get and he's not grabbing 10 a game. Uh, and then just the lob opportunities, he, opportunities he should have, some of the flashes we've seen just from him being able to maneuver in the post, uh, you know, maybe some close jumpers. I can see him getting 12 points a game. So that's a pretty, 12 rebounds would be really, really healthy. Like it's not a lot of guys that average double-double rebounds. I actually did a hoops, uh, a hoops grid the other day and it was like players that averaged 10 rebounds. I put Steven Adams for OKC. He never averaged 10 rebounds the entire time. He he, he was in OKC. Like that's a more rare uh, threshold than you would expect from some of the better rebounder there's in the league, but I'm going to stick with 12 for Jalen Duran based on what I saw from him last season. Well, the thing is, he's such a monster offensively, you know, with offensive rebounds, getting, you know, a couple, three a game, you know, and then you're going to get some defensively just because you're the guy in the paint. And again, I, I kind of skewed my Isaiah Stewart rebounding numbers down because of my expert expectations for what Jalen Dern is going to do with his rebounding. Again, I want to emphasize, and I know we got called out a little bit on this because we went at Jalen Dern for his defense and not Jaden Ivey. And we can talk about that when we talk about Jaden Ivey next. But I think that's the area where I want to see the biggest jump from Jalen Dern. And it doesn't just have to be with the actual block shot numbers. Obviously, that's kind of how we're representing it. But at the end of the day, I think for this team to really take a jump, yes, Jay Nivey's going to have to improve defensively. Kay's going to have to be better defensively. But I think Jalen Duran really anchoring this defense, especially in ball screen situations, those type of things, I think is going to be huge. So that's really the biggest area I'm looking for a jump. And if we see this team be better overall defensively, I have an inclination it's going to be because Jalen Duran took a jump. He needs to make a leap in that area for sure. I think a lot of their rim protection hopes next season are going to hinge on him. Unless, again, we're seeing Isaiah Stewart play some five, which could happen, you know, but a lot of that will be decided in camp. So, yeah, I think we everybody agrees with that. We got to see Jalen Duran become the rim protector this team needs. So we're right around 12 points, 12 rebounds, and a block and a half a game for Jalen Duran this next season. And next up is Jaden Ivey. Before we even get into this, Omari, 
I feel like Jaden Ivey is like one of the most disliked Detroit Piston players all of a sudden. I see everybody trying to trade him. I see people giving love to Cade and Asar and Duran, but don't mention Jaden Ivey. I'm a little bit confused, Omari, just because what did Jaden Ivey do in his rookie season that caused people to what seems like believe in him less than what they did 12. We got cooked. Remember last year? We got cooked for projecting his stat line. I have a feeling the same is going to happen whenever we do the Asar stat line. But we got cooked for being too low on him. And I feel like now the fan base is just like, eh, he's just kind of an afterthought. I don't know if people are just so excited about Cade and Asar and Duran, but it's just, it's really interesting to me. I'm not calling anybody out. It's just very interesting to me. I think he still has a lot of support. I think he gets included in a lot of trades just because if you're just looking at this team long-term, it's probably easier to replace Ivy's for the production than like what Duran could be or what Cade could be uh, just as a scoring guard, uh, which, you know, isn't a knock on him, obviously. It's just if you're playing the trade machine and they don't have a job pick to give up until, you know, six years from now, uh, you got to do something. Uh, but I think along with that, probably just uh, his first summer league game, you know, because you know people put a lot of stock into that. So that could have been the thing that maybe turns people off of him, which, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But I would agree that from a hype standpoint, it's probably been a lot more K than the SAR this offseason. Yeah, I don't know. It was just was interesting. And so we'll see. Last season, he averaged 16.3 points, 3.9 rebounds, 5.2 assists, 41.6% from the field, 34.3% from three. Uh, where are you at with Jaden Ivey? Uh, I don't know. Are you going to go a little bit low again this year and we'll get the wrath of the fan base for our, you know, not having high enough expectations for Ivey? Or are you going to bump those numbers up? Some numbers are going to go up. Some are going to go down a little bit. I have them at 17 points, uh, four rebounds, uh, four assists. So that's one fewer assist than last season. And 44% overall. Uh, and I still have them at 34% from three. Man, we think way too much alike. So uh, I just want everybody to know, we did not talk about this whatsoever. I don't know where Amari put his numbers, but I copied the outline that Wes made and created a new one and put my numbers in there. So we don't discuss this ahead of time. We don't talk to each other. I have Jaden Ivey at 18 points per game, four rebounds, five assists. So I went down a little bit, not quite as much as you. We'll talk about why I did that in just a second, or probably why both of us think it's a little less. I have him at 45% from the field, and I had him saying right at 34% from three as well. So we were very much aligned there. Um, yeah, I just see assists going down just because Kay's back, and it's really Same. not, you know, it's not a knock on Jaden or anything like that. Like, I don't think he's going to be worse at passing. If anything, I think he'll improve not having to do everything himself like last season. It's just, you have Cade, you have Monte Morris. It's just, you know, there's only so many assists that could go around, right? And I think on this team, you could probably just tell Jaden, hey, just go out and square. We have the playmaking handle. But he'll still play make some. Uh, maybe he even gets some more run at the one. But just the way this team is constructed, I think he'll probably attack a little bit more. I had the points go up because he's playing with Cade. I think overall, this offense is going to be better. I assume we both agree on that. That. And then I think his assists go down because, like you say, he's going to be playing with Cade. I also think, you know, Monty Morris is going to handle the ball some. You have this really good, like you've said it, one of the better backup point guards in the NBA. You have a Sar Thompson, Amari, who I think can handle and create just a little bit. So I think that's really interesting. This is from Mel. That sounds about right for Ivy. I hope the three point percentage goes up to 35, 36 though, since he'll have more catch and shoot, which he's good at. So that's where I was going to go with the three-point percentage male. I think it stays the same because I think we're still going to see him take some of those off the bounce, behind a ball screen, kind of heat checky-ish from five seconds, of, Yeah, five seconds to the shot clock pull up. Yeah, he's, yeah. He just, he's not gonna be able to help himself. I think it's one of those things we're just gonna have to live with it. But the true unguarded catch and shoot numbers were really good, Omari. And truly at the end of the day, right now at least, that's all I care about. And I think those numbers are gonna stay true. And so I think it'll continue to balance out. He may get more of those, right? Though playing off Cade and a really good ball mover and a SAR and a good passer and Jalen Duran. So maybe the volume does go up with those and the, the percentage ticks up just a little bit. I'm in the same boat. If he gets to 35, and it's just because he's getting more self-created looks, so it wouldn't shock me if he gets to 35 or 36. It's just 
same thing for me. I just assume he's going to take more self-created threes, which isn't inherently problematic. Like, he had enough last season that, you know, I thought it, it warranted it. It's just those are naturally going to be lower percentage shots for the vast majority of players. So it just balances out. But 34, 35, I think he'll be right in that range. And teams aren't going to, aren't going to help off him or leave him open. He's going to be a threat. So our average here ends up at 17 and a half points, four rebounds, four and a half assists, almost 45% from the field, 34% from three. I'll say one of the aspects of these is in those numbers, he's got to get better finishing at the rim, Amari. That's one area I'm looking at offensively. That's the area I would say I have the, the biggest question mark about. Now, he was a rookie who was always more athletic than everybody else, more explosive, and it's an adjustment in the NBA. So I'm not like thinking he's not going to be able to do it. I just want to see it. That's offensively. Defensively, he's got to get better, right? Somebody said, hey, you're calling out Jalen Duran. Why aren't you guys calling out Jaden Ivey? Well, here it is. Okay, and it's not just because people brought it up. I've been saying this about Jaden Ivey. And at the end of the day, Omari, the, the concerns go back to college at Purdue. It was flashes. He would flash an ability to really guard on the ball. He would flash a really good rotation off the ball. And then a couple possessions later, you're kind of scratching your head. So I think it's consistency defensively, Amari. And then offensively, he's got to find just that finesse and that touch around the rim. We've talked about, there was some wide open layups where he just wasn't able to slow himself down that even if he just made those, his percentage would have jumped a couple points. Yeah, we talk a lot about the shooting, but the finishing really is the key for him. Uh, you know, I think taking a leap next season because he just didn't finish as well as you would want to see last season, especially for somebody with his size and speed and athleticism. Uh, it, you know, I think there were a handful of reasons for that, right? I think one, uh, he didn't always have maybe the body control or, um, you know, just things like that at the rim needed to just finagle some of those layups since we saw like a lot of tough misses. I think some of that was, you know, just improving his handle. Sometimes he got a little too fast and then he just wasn't able to really gather the way he needed to and get to the rim. Like a handful of reasons that go into that. So I do think he'll iron some of that out with an offseason of work, understanding what he needs to be better at. But he has the tools to be an elite finisher, right? Like not just an average, but an elite one. And that's probably going to be a longer go for him as he kind of, I guess, grows into his body and gets used to his speed. And of course, the NBA physicality as well. Yeah, and Wes says, reminds him a little bit of Brandon Knight in regards just to what Amari was talking about there. That's a good comparison. Yeah, yeah, Brandon Knight. That's Jaden Ivey. be really interesting. I'm really excited. And to what we talked about earlier, Amari, I understand why eventually Jaden Ivey may be the guy that needs to get moved. I, I don't live in the world where, and I think a lot of fans don't, so because we have a smart fan base, where I, I don't think any of us believe all four of these guys are going to stick together. We love this young core, but most likely at some point, there's a trade that consolidates two or consolidates one plus draft picks. And I can understand why people think it's going to be Jaden Ivey. I just don't think it should be right now. It just sometimes to me, it's like, man, we, we've only seen him for a year and he was pretty darn good. And so why not want to see how he grows and plays with Cade and those type of things? I did want to get to this question real quick before we move on to Cade. From Logan Naughty, did you guys expect Jaden Ivey to look that good playing off ball and running all over the place? I will just say I've been on this off ball train with Jaden Ivey offensively. I thought he could flourish as long as he was willing to do it. So it doesn't surprise me that he could look good playing off the ball. I've always felt like that's where he was going to be at his best with some on ball, you know, possessions mixed in. But you give him an unsettled defense, I think he can attack that really well. It's interesting because we haven't really seen him play off ball, right? I yeah. mean, he was, you know, the man last season with Cade out. Uh, he was the man at Purdue. So we haven't really seen him in that role to the extent that you would want to see him in that role. So I'm curious. I'm curious to see how, like how it unburdens him, uh, not having the ball at all times. He can pick his spots. He can cut, get wide open, catch and shoot threes. Uh, and the main thing with him, just even beyond everything we talked about, is just getting into a, a, a rhythm. It seems like a lot of times last season, those first few shots would dictate his entire night. Like if he hit a pull-up three, like his first pull-up three, it's like, okay, he's scoring 30, right? So uh, maybe playing off ball would be easier for him to get those easy looks and he might have to self-create as much. So I'm curious to see what off ball Jaden and Ivy looks because I really don't know what to expect as far as that. Well, and Cade's going to help with that as well because you know yeah. Cade's the type of guy, if Jaden hits his first shot and Cade learns like, man, when this guy hits his first one, he gets it going tonight, you know Cade is going to force feed in the ball and keep it flowing. Or if he sees that Jaden's in one of those moods where he's struggling a little bit or whatever, that could be the night where we see Cade just do a little bit more scoring on his own. And so let's talk about the face of the franchise. Just under 20 points per game, six rebounds, six assists, 
41.5% from the field, 28%, just under 28% from the three-point line. Last year, we know it was, what, 12 games or whatever. Still not awful numbers for a guy who was playing with the pain that he was playing and the injury he was playing through. What do we expect to see from Cade Cunningham this season? So I have him at 23 points, uh, still six rebounds, still six assists. And the percentage is going up a uh, pretty healthy amount. I have him at 45% overall field goal percentage. And then I have him at 34% from three. So shout out Caleb here. He says, finally caught you all live. Always a great listen. Keep doing your thing. Appreciate, yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. That, I know it's hard, guys, to catch us. We're recording on Thursdays and then Sundays and we're changing the time. We're we're recording during the middle of the Lions game, you know, whatever. So it is it is what it is. We, we just got to make it work. We got crazy lives around here. My stat line for Cade, 25 points per game, more than six rebounds a game, more than six assists a game. How many more? How many more? 40, I'll come back to it. 45% okay. from the field and greater than 33% from three. So I, I just, I'm going all in on this. I just, I have to, if I believe in the restoration, if I believe Cade Cunningham is who I thought he was when the Pistons drafted him, even when I was scouting him before the Pistons drafted him, I got to believe he's going to make this kind of jump in year three. I know he's missed time, but if he's healthy, I got to believe this is the guy that he's going to be. He's going to be the man. And here's the other thing. He does have a decent roster around him to allow him to do this. You can put a shooting lineup on the floor. He has three different lob threats, Omari. In year one, before the trade deadline, he didn't have any lob threats. Now he has three guys that can catch a lob. He has a wing perimeter defender in Asar Thompson that can take all those matchups. He has a run, like, I just think he's, it's not perfect. It's not a perfect roster, but he's set up to do these kind of numbers. I don't know where that puts him in the hierarchy of the NBA, but I have big expectations. Yeah, I mean, those are healthy numbers. You have to, how many assists and how many rebounds? We, you're just doing like these greater than. I told we, you. We, we, we need numbers. We need numbers. So I, I just felt like if I was like, man, Cade's going to average 25, 8, and 8. It's like, okay, well, Cade's not going to be an MVP candidate this year. So that seems a little ridiculous. So I I didn't want to put decimals in. I didn't want to be like 6.6 .6 or whatever. So 25, 7, and 7. 25, 6 and a half, 6 and a half. There. Okay. Is that fair? Can we do that? That's fair. That's that fair. helps yeah, Wes out. Yeah. I don't know where that's going to do the averages. We're going to have like a 0.25 somewhere now or something like that. But that, yeah, I, I think that's going to be... Am I crazy to, to think those are something he can do? No, I, I, don't, I don't think that's crazy at all. I think a lot of it is just, it's like a shot volume question, right? You know, so many mouths to feed. You know, does he go into attack mode and get his 25? Or is it more so get everybody else going? I attack when I need to. So I think I'm probably... More of the latter, like, you know, I think he could score 25. It's not, like, lack of ability or anything. It's just more so, I don't know if he's going to attack the game in that way where he's going to be looking to do it. And also, we're talking, like, a two-point difference. Like, it's not, like, you know, super big. But I, I think we'll see K defer and probably be, not defer, but just more so try to get his teammates going and play more, like, point guard style than I'm just going to go, like, wing score and get my own. Okay, so that's really interesting. I want to stay on this for just a second. You kind of answered it, but I put that in my notes. I said... I'm actually more confident in the points per game than the assists per game because I think this roster actually requires him to be the number one scoring option. Now, I want to say, because I actually tend to agree a little bit more with you. Coming out of college, I saw Cade more as a facilitator, great passer, clutch bucket getter, but I know a lot of people see him as a number one scoring option. I've always said, I don't think he's the leading scorer when the Pistons win a championship. I actually think he's probably the second leading scorer, but he's still the face of the franchise. You think we're going to see that this year where he's more of like, just get guys open and doesn't necessarily feel like he has to be the primary bucket getter. I think early on we will see that. I'll say that. Uh, I think what I'm curious about is if that changes as the season goes on and maybe... Uh, the win column isn't quite where they want it to be. You know, does he start to call his own number more and put the team on his shoulders, so to say, more often? So I think we can see that role evolve as the year goes on, just depending on what the team needs from him. But it's certainly realistic that he's going to have to just really go out and score to keep this team going. Well, and I think it also depends what lineup he plays with the most, right? If he's playing a lot of his minutes with Boyan and Jaden, 
now all of a sudden those guys, and it, here's the thing. At the end of the day, we talked about James Wiseman earlier, Omari. If James Wiseman is on the floor, they might as well make him an option offensively, right? Because it, it's not like his defense is what's going to really be super impactful. So if you're going to play James Wiseman, you better make him a huge part of the offense and let him score and do his thing. You could argue that's similar with Marvin Bagley the third. So West did the numbers for us. Our average is 24 points per game, 6.25 assists, 6.25 rebounds, 45% from the field, 34% from three. Great question here from YouTube user. Always appreciate you tuning in. I think you were actually watching when I was recording Game Theory with Sam Vecini the other night as well. So I appreciate that. He They ask how many turnovers for Cade per game. That's a really interesting question, Amari. I'm going to go three, uh, you know, two to one assist ratio. You know, he probably still have some turnovers that are like, you know, why did you throw that like he had as a rookie? But I don't, I, I, I do think he'll probably be a little bit more efficient passing than he was as a rookie as well. I think he was what, 3.5 as a rookie? He was like yeah. six, 3.5, something like that. So I see that going down a little bit. I know a lot of people's issue, quote unquote, with Kate is the efficiency hasn't been great from the field, which is fair. And then the turnovers. I haven't been worried about the turnovers. And again, I think we're all hoping the efficiency had to do with the injury. So yeah, somebody like Cade who handles the ball as much as he will is going to average a two to three, three turnovers a game is, I, I think anything less than that would just be miraculous. So real quick from our guy, Jack Kelly, he says, Wiseman slander, Wes will be furious. So Jack, you can come on and you can talk about that here in a couple <laughs> weeks whenever you join the, the Pistons polls. But we appreciate you. T- Who knows what time it is where Jack's at right now, man. I, I love that we got people listening and tuning in from all over the world. It's amazing. Omari, we got to go to a short break. When we come back, we will talk about the Summer League sensation, both of the rookies, the vet, Boyan. But we're going to start with Asar Thompson when we come back from this. All right, back with segment three and our first player that we don't have stats to go off of from last year. So this should be fun. Uh, Sar Thompson, Summer League, averaged 13.5 points, 10 rebounds, three and a half assists, uh, basically 47% overall and 27% from three. I will say if he averaged anything close to that next season, I think that would probably be a first team, our rookie season. Uh, but again, you kind of get into road as he start. Does he come off the bench? How many minutes are there immediately? How ready will he be? That makes it tough to project. But I'm going to go... Actually, Bryce, you lead off. You lead off. No, no, man. Actually, you lead off. You're, you lead you're off. selling me out right here. Okay. Lead off. This, I'm going to get in trouble. I just... People are going to be so mad at me and I'm going to take it. I'm going to I'm gonna live with it because I said this after Summer League that it's not going to be the box... Sco- I want us all to remember that what we loved about Asar from Summer League wasn't necessarily the box score numbers, Amari. It was what he did defensively, the winning plays he made, all of those intangible things. It wasn't because he averaged 20 points a game in Summer League. If we wanted that, we'd all be talking about, man, they missed out on Cam Whitmore because he got buckets in Summer League and nobody's asking for Cam Whitmore. So don't hate me whenever I give these numbers. I think Asar actually ends up less than 10 points per game but right around five rebounds, right around two and a half assists, 50% from the field. I think he actually shoots less than 25% from three, but I think he establishes himself as the best perimeter defender on the Detroit Pistons as a rookie. I'm pretty similar. I have him at nine points in a neighborhood of five rebounds. A lot of that just depends on minutes. Uh, Two and a half assists. I had him, I think my field percentage is probably lower. I had him at like 46 and then a lot of that's just because of the, the three-point percentage because I'm sure teams are going to play off of him and he'll probably take more than he needs to just because of that. But I do have him shooting a pretty low percentage from three, like 25%. So we're, we're pretty similar, but I'm a tad lower on the uh, points just because of the, yeah, I mean, almost exactly what Mel has here. Yeah, still in a half. Uh, I think that's realistic. I don't know if you'll have a, a, a full block, but he has such a knack for blocking those jumpers that I really can't count that out at all. I mean, if he's averaging 2.5 stocks next season, that's extremely healthy. So that would be great. So I think the 9, 8, and so I think the assists are a little bit high here from Sean. But I think a lot of people are on the same page, Omari. I think a lot of people feel like he's going to be under 10 points because he's just not going to get the shots, right? And I think here's another thing. It depends a little bit how this team plays. If they really, really get out and transition and value that, I could see... A SARS points being a little bit more. 
I do think Asar is going to struggle to score the basketball in the half court. I think his points come from transition, offensive rebound putbacks, cutting, those kind of off-the-ball plays. I think the other stuff will come with time. I may have been a little bit slight with the rebounding, and that's going to depend on the minutes because if there was one thing he was super impressive with at Summer League, it was his rebound in Mari. So I think that just comes down to minutes. Is he going to start? You know, how much are they going to get livers in Joe Harris? I mean, I know that would frustrate the fan base. I've said, hey, why not start the kid? But I could see them bring him off the bench. But if he's only playing 20, 25 minutes a night, is he going to be able to average eight rebounds? This kid might be able to. Um, but I, my stat line was not a knock on him at all. And I had him higher on field goal percentage, Amari, because I think he understands what's a good shot and what's not, what he can do. And I think he'll play within himself. And he's going to take a lot of good shots, right? You yeah. Know, he'll get a lot of shots in transition. He'll make himself available in cuts. He's going to catch lobs. He's going to do all that stuff that you want to see an off-ball wing do. So uh, he'll have a, I think he'll have a pretty healthy uh, shot diet next season, you know, just with all of his activity. A lot of it is just rolling. I mean, if he's starting, then I could probably go up to, what, like 11, 7, rebounds, 3 assists. I don't think that would be outside the question. So just a tad under that feels safe, right? Yeah. So nine and a half points, five rebounds, two and a half assists, 48% from the field, 25% from three is our average. Again, whenever we put the averages together, it seems about right. If I think we're low anywhere, Amari, if there's a spot I'm nervous about, it's probably the rebounds. I don't know how you feel, but that's probably the area where I'm like, man, we may have went a little slight there. I feel pretty comfortable that he's most likely going to average less than 10 points per game. I feel pretty good about all of it. Um, you know, like this team has like a lot of plus rebounders now. Well, I don't know. So they have Duran, Isaiah can rebound, Wiseman can rebound, Kay's a good rebounder for his size. Uh, then you have Asar. So I guess it kind of gets to the same question earlier. Who, like, who how is many he rebounds playing with? Yeah, like who is he playing with and how many rebounds are just going to be there? If he's playing with Duran, he's probably not going to get as many. So it's just a lot of that is lineup dependent and they do have pretty healthy rebounding uh, with the way the roster is constructed. So I think I think five is a good estimate. Yeah, no, I mean, if he's playing with Cade, Ivy, Stu and Duran for a lot of his minutes, there's not a whole lot of rebounds left to go. Now, if he's playing in a second unit lineup, let's say Amari of Monty Morris, Alec Burke, Isaiah Livers, and Marvin Bagley, all of a sudden he may be gobbling up you know, rebounds because you don't have a whole lot outside of Bagley and it's not necessarily something he's known for. So I think it does depend a little bit on minutes. And again, I want to reiterate, We've all talked about there potentially being another trade before the season. There's also an open roster spot. So, you know, we're doing this a little bit premature, but it's a lot of fun to do. It's been really good conversation so far. Yeah. And I'm also curious to see if we see a star play to four. And that's by I want to question going into next season. If he plays a four, then you could probably take the rebounds up a little bit. But I'm curious to see if he plays four. Like he's six, six, seven foot wingspan. Uh we talked about weak side side shot blocking. Like, oh. can he give you that? I mean, I'm just curious to see if he ends up playing some four next season. I mean, it's the Hami role on steroids with yeah. Asar. What you know, what we saw Hami do pretty well last year whenever he really found his niche and his role, and it's that, but Asar does it with better decision making, better defense, more potential, m- even more athleticism, all of that. All right. Marcus Sasser, last year in college. Shout out Marcus Sasser, by the way. What an incredible interview. I know we got a lot of compliments and all of that from people who tuned into that. If you haven't listened yet or watched, it's on the YouTube feed or you know, scroll down a little bit on Apple, Spotify and listen to that. But thank you so much to Marcus for coming on and letting us talk to him about the season and summer league and all of that. In college, he averaged just under 17 points, just under three rebounds, three assists, 44% from the field, 38% from three. Obviously, that's college. What do you think we see from Marcus Sasser in his rookie season? So it's just row wise right? Like, they're in a position where they really don't have to play him that much unless we have some injuries. So that's tough. That's tough. You know, like, I think if he had to row, uh, he could definitely average some healthy numbers, like, really just with his shooting and, and playmaking. And he's 23 years old, so he'll come in ready. You know, I'm just going to go, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go five points, two assists, uh, two rebounds, uh, 44% overall. Uh, 36% from three. You know, I just I, I just think he gets a lot of spot minutes, you know, to start the, the season. Maybe it's a blowout one way or another. You know, with guys like that, it's just really impossible to get an accurate read on, you know, just how big their load will be uh, going into next season. So that's just, I just feel like a safe a, a safe range, right? He may have some games where he gets like 15, 16 points, but I just don't know how much he's actually going to play to start the season, so. 
Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I'm five points, couple rebounds, couple assists. The biggest spot we differ, I'm actually going to go 40% from the field, but also 40% from three. So I okay. think he shoots lights out, but I'm not sure he gets a whole lot of... I don't even know how many attempts he gets from anywhere else on the floor. Now, as we talked about with him and we've talked about before, he showed some wiggle and some juice with the ball in his hands, especially in that final summer league game. I'm just not sure that's his role. I don't think they're going to give him the ball and say, Marcus, go cook. I think he's going to play off of Cade, off of a bigger guard and just really space the floor. And I think most of his attempts come from three and I believe in the shot. And so, you know, 40% from three, 40, maybe it's 41% from the field or something like that. But I'm with you. I, I, I think they're going to play Monty Morris quite a bit. I think they're going to at least play Alec Burks. If he's on the roster, they're going to play him. And so it's a little bit difficult to find those minutes for him, even though he is an older player who is a little bit more NBA ready than what you might normally find in a rookie first round pick. Let's move on to Boyan Bogdanovic. And I feel like this is a tough one just because he's probably not going to take the same amount of shots he took last season. And I'm also at the point now to where it's like, the points can't be too high. We have K at 23 to 25. We have Ivy at around 17. Where can we put Boyan without the Pistons averaging like 130 points, right? So I'll let you lead off, Bryce. Where do you have Boyan next season? So real quick on Sasser, we had him at five points, two assists, two rebounds, 42% from the field, 38% from three. I kept him right around 20 points per game. I could see it dipping though, Amari, down to what? 16, 17, 18, something like that. He shot... 49% from the field and 41% from three last year. So I think where the dip for Boyan actually comes, I think we should expect some regression to the mean in his efficiency. Last year was the best of his career from the field from three. And I just don't know that we can anticipate him doing the same thing. So he's probably getting less shots. He's probably a little less efficient. Maybe he's not. Maybe this is just who he's going to be for the next few years. And if he is, great. But even if he is that efficient, the numbers have to go down because he's not going to get the attempts. Even if the efficiency drops to just somewhat human, you're looking at 17, 18 points a game. I think we do see some regression to the mean only because he was just absolutely ridiculous last season Unreal. to shoot 49% over on 41% for three on a 17-win team and defenses are you know paying attention solely to you for the most part, like you and Ivy. That's just... Yeah, I see the points going down. I don't think they'll have to lean on him as much just with the additions they made this offseason. I think he'll still be really efficient. I have him at 16 points, uh, three rebounds, two assists, 47% overall, 40% from three. So still really healthy averages, just a little bit lower. And then, of course, the points are just lower just because I don't think the shot attempts will be as high as last season. Well, and at the end of the day, Omar, if he shoots 40% from three still, to me, that's all that matters. Some of the other yeah. stuff he did last year was like, dang, a bogey's got it like that? Yeah. Uh, honestly, I don't want him doing that too much anyway because I want to make sure Cade is getting final shots of the games. I don't want us to go into bogey hero ball. And so, like, he just needs to chill a little bit where, you know, Monty Williams isn't thinking, oh, maybe we'll give this ball to bogey. But as long as he continues to space the floor, I think that's what really matters. He's another guy. We've talked about this. We've mentioned this multiple times. And obviously, guys, as we get closer to the season and training camp and all that, we're going to really preview the season and the rotation and the roster and all that stuff. It's crazy, Omari. I think one of the coolest things about this roster is the competition. You think back to some years and we're like, oh, so-and-so has to play the three because there's not really another true NBA player on the roster. What? Which one of these guys of the 14 isn't a real NBA player right now? I, I mean, I think you can make an argument, make a case for all of them. And if you really want to say, like, you could take the rookies out if you want, Killian's probably been the worst NBA player outside of that. And I would be fine if Killian Hayes was in the rotation. I've said that. I just don't think he's going to be with the current roster. So there's a lot of competition. Our average there for Boyan, 17 points per game, three and a half rebounds, two assists, 47% from the field, 40% from three. So I think that's a, a good spot. And, you know, again, if he stays over 40% from three, I'm going to be happy with him, Amari. I mean, I agree. That's the most important thing with him is just continuing to provide that floor spacing that they need. And if he does that, um, you know, that's really what they need from him. So uh, we can move on to Isaiah Livers. Uh, last season averaged 6.7 points, 2.8 rebounds, half a steal, 42% overall, 
36.5% from three. So obviously Isaiah's kind of battled some injuries. Uh, his three-point shooting regressed last season compared to his rookie year. Um, and probably you get into some of the row stuff with him as well. But Bryce, I'll let you lead off with... And this is going to be re- really telling as far as how you see his role next season. But what are your numbers for Isaiah Livers? Yeah, I'm just going to be blunt, man. And this is going to hurt. This is really, really going to hurt Amari. I just put, sadly, I don't think he's in the rotation. Oh, wow. Okay. I don't think Isaiah Livers is in the rotation next year. I think he's out of the rotation. I mean, so you're looking at a few points a game, a rebound, a, you know, half a steal. I, I hope I'm wrong. Like, I hope this is one of the situations where the last couple of years, I've boosted him going into the season. Think he was going to have a big role. Think he was a great fit. All of these things. And it ended up the other way. Maybe I'm trying to play the reverse psychology this offseason because I love Isaiah Livers. I think he's a really good player. It just hasn't worked. And so I'm going to go into this season with my expectations of, you know, he's the 12th or 13th man who's who's not going to get the playing time. And I hate it. I see him in the rotation. I think defensively he'll add a lot. And if he could hit threes, just that three and D presence, I think, is something that Monty would want to lean on. Uh, I have Isaiah Livers. I have him at, I have him at nine points, oh, wow. three rebounds, uh, 0.7 steals, forty three percent overall, thirty thirty eight percent from three. So you know he's probably taking four or five threes a game. You know I think he'll be. A, I think his his defense and just probably the need for more shooting at the four will keep him into the rotation. But obviously he has to one stay healthy and then two uh, hit a high percentage of threes. Which even last season, I mean thirty six point five percent still. Bad like solid so uh, if that ticks up a little bit defense the communication remains pretty sound uh, I think he'll just 3 and D just pretty plain 3 and D numbers honestly so you think most of his minutes are going to come at the 4 there where I, I think everybody in the fan day feels like there's a little bit of a hole at the backup 4 position I guess depending on what you feel about Isaiah Stewart and Boyan but is that where you think his minutes are going to come from then I think that's where it could end up going um, especially if they're really serious about winning games I just don't see how you play two bigs together to the extent that they did last year. And if you're not doing that, then that means two of the bigs are probably outside of their rotation and you're relying on some mix of Boyan, Livers, maybe Asar, maybe somebody else to kind of fill in those minutes at the four. Isaiah Stewart, obviously. So, you know, I'm just I'm just curious to see, like, spacing-wise, what Monty prefers. Like, just in Phoenix, he always wanted four shooters on the floor. If Livers can knock down shots, I just, I just think that role would be there for him. So Livers, we had six points per game, two rebounds, 43% from the field, 37% from three. As Wes adds up those totals for us, and then we'll talk about it. I want to say real quick, Mel, I know you asked about the nine, 10 man run. We're going to save that. We got to, we got to have content here in a month from now. So we're going to save some of the rotation talk. We're not like trying to, you know, not listen to you and read the comments and give you guys what you want, but we, we got to keep some of that a little bit. So while Wes is adding those up, there were a couple comments, one from two different people. What do we think Cade's free throw attempts will be? So this is just Football Academy Australia. I believe that's Rocky. Do you think Cade gets to the free throw line more this season? And then from Mel, how many free throw attempts per game for Cade? So Amari, what number kind of jumps out to you there? I'm going to go five free throws a game. I think I'm looking up his rookie year now because I forget how many he had. Yeah, he averaged two and a half as a rookie and then three and a half last season. Um, you know, obviously playing on the on on the shin that was injured. I think four and a half, like five free throws a game uh, seems pretty reasonable. Um, you know, a lot of that, you know, I'm just curious to see how he attacks the pain and if he gets a, a better whistle than he's gotten in the in the past. But, you know, with his physicality, with, you know, his ability to get to the rim, I think that's probably a real, realistic outcome for him. I would love it. All right, this is from Doug, man. I, we got to always shout out Doug because he comes in and listens. says, on a dog day in August night, you guys can still make Pistons feel relevant, like making a ham sandwich <laughs> seem like a gourmet dinner. Now I'm hungry. I haven't even had supper yet. It's nine o'clock here in Kansas. I went from school to a little kid's football to I had a meeting and then high school football scrimmage. Now I went straight to this, showed up about two minutes before recording like a not very good co-host. I apologize, Amari. So um, I am starving myself. Probably going to have to warm up some pizza. But Doug, thank you. We appreciate that. One last one here before we get to those totals. This is from Caleb. How to give him some love since he finally was able to join us. What do you think Weaver needs to see from the young guys? This is interesting, Omari, to be willing to trade Boyan and or Alec Burks. They got to be able to handle whatever role Monty has for them. And they got to do it with flying colors, I think, for them to say, okay, we're going to trade one of these two vets that, you know, I think they've 
been pretty pretty clear about when to you know keep it just core as long as they reasonably can. So I mean, a lot of it's just just growth, right? Like if those guys come in, they're above average starters, doing everything you need. Um, Boyan and Burks were just excellent bucket getters last season. So I think the young guys really have to bring it for the Pistons to say, yeah, we can trade these guys at the deadline. I mean, unless there's always scenarios that could come up that makes a trade more likely, but it's just the young guys really coming out on fire this season, I think. I think they have to show that they can win games, right? That they're ready to take the step to be winning basketball players. And I think with Boyan, if Isaiah Stewart shooting the ball well, that you know, he can play that role, not that role, but now you don't need Boyan to play the four. So Stu can play the four and you're okay. If Asar really shows he's ready, now you kind of have the three and the four locked up in the starting lineup. Maybe Isaiah Livers, we just talked about him. If all three of those guys show what you think they can, all right, well, now maybe we don't need Boyan Bogdanovich. I think Burks is a little bit easier to move because you have Monty Morris. And I know we had a question about him. We do need to dive into him a little bit more at some point, and we will do that. But with Monty Morris back there, if Sasser's ready to go, then, you know, like that, that'll be a situation where now you don't need Burks and you can move him for an asset. So thanks, Jack. We appreciate it. We're going to get out of here with this. So from Wes... Team point per game in 2022 was 110. I believe that was 29th in the league. Around team, there. Yeah. Team, yeah. Team point per game leader in 2022 was the Bucks at just under 119. Our pulse projected point per game for what we did tonight was 113.5. So I feel like without that's like, right on the money, right? Without, without yeah. doing anything yeah. crazy, I feel like that's very fair for I think I actually looked this up and this would put them roughly 20th in the league somewhere around there. Now a lot of this has to do do they play faster, do they not transition, pace of play, all of that stuff. But I would assume a 3 point per game jump on offense And then if the defense gets a little bit better, I would assume that's a pretty decent jump in total wins. So I I think this is fair where we're at. I think we're being pretty reasonable. Would love to hear, one, we appreciate everybody in the comments tonight that interacted and gave us their thoughts. If you're listening to this later on, leave us a five-star review. Give us your thoughts. DBB, free, wherever, on the YouTube. If you're watching later on, drop it in the comments. We love to interact. Um, It was a lot of fun, though, and, and I feel like we ended up in a good spot, Amari. Yeah, 113.5. You know, and obviously there'll probably be some rotation swaps where, you know, you factor Alec Burks in there. So maybe you just assign Killian's points to him or whatever else. But I think 113.5 feels like right on. Like it's not too high. It's not too low. It's an improvement from last season, which they they should be better offensively from last season. I mean, there's not a whole lot <laughs> worse you can be, um, you know, especially with K back. But that feels pretty dead on. So it'd be fun to revisit this a year from now and, you know, see how close we were. All right, Amari, the time that most people are listening to this, you are already off season O. It's hard for me to see it on Twitter, man. It makes me a little bit sad, but I know you deserve it. So shout out to you, man. Put it in the grind, you know, 50 weeks out of the year. You need this. Enjoy it. Remember, guys, I'll be back with Keith Smith next week. And then the goats at DBB Live, Wes and Jack will be on the week after that. And then, of course, my guy Amari will return and we'll get back into our regular schedule. Thank you, everybody. Omari, take it away, my guy. Yeah, it's crazy. I've not, this is episode 85. I have not missed a single episode of the pod this entire time. It's just been the Omari and Bryce show. So it'll be fun listening to the pod the next two weeks while I'm gone and seeing, you know, just how different the vibe is, right? Like Keith Smith next week, obviously, will be great. Um, he's going to come in and give you guys a lot of fantastic info. Then I believe we're going to have our guy Jack Kelly in uh, the weekend after that. And Jack's just been killing it. So I know that'll be a lot of fun. So, yeah, this is like, uh, you know, the TV special when like one of the characters goes away for a little bit or whatever. Like, you know, but, it, but it'll be cool. I have some, some travel plan. I'll just bum around the house, uh, you know, see some friends. Like, it'll be fun. So it'll be good to get away. And with that, I'll close this out. Uh, big thanks to our audio producer, Robert Chan, our executive producer, Anjanette Delgado, and our sports editor, Kirkland Crawford. Also, shout out to Wes, who put the calculator to work tonight. And they'll talk to you all next week. I'll talk to you guys in a few weeks. Thank you.